Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we learned about the symmetry of molecules, and we saw that we can group molecules into different categories called point groups, depending on what symmetry elements the molecule contains. If you haven't seen the previous video, you'll definitely want to give it a look, because we'll use much of what we learned in that video today. Today I want to show you how we can use what we learned about symmetry to understand infrared spectra of molecules. It turns out that we can summarize a lot of the symmetry information about point groups in a kind of chart called a character table. There are character tables for a few dozen different point groups in our textbook, and these can be a bit difficult to interpret, so let's talk about them for a few minutes. For example, let's think about water. In the last video, we saw that water belongs to the point group C2V. Let's look at the character table for that point group. In the upper left corner is the name of the point group, in this case C2V. Along the top row is a list of the different symmetry elements that a molecule belonging to this point group must contain. In this case, the molecule must have the identity element E, if you watched the previous video, that'll come as no surprise. Every molecule contains the identity element, because this tells us to do nothing with our molecule in order to return it to its original appearance. The next symmetry element is a C2 rotation axis, which water certainly contains. Finally, the next two symmetry elements are vertical mirror planes. Water has two such planes, and the character table tells us that one is in the xz plane, and the other is in the yz plane. Which plane is which? The conventional way of describing the three axes is that the z-axis is the one that corresponds to the major axis of the molecule. So, in the case of water, the z-axis is this one. Meanwhile, if the molecule is flat, the x-axis is in the plane of the molecule. So in water, that means the x-axis is here, which means that the y-axis is the last remaining one. So the xz vertical mirror plane is the one that contains the molecule, and the yz plane is the one that bisects the bond angle. The rest of the character table contains information that will help us interpret vibrational spectra. Let's do that next. First, let's remind ourselves of the kinds of vibration that a molecule can have. As we saw in video 13, it turns out that there are only three basic types of vibration that a molecule can have. These are the symmetric stretch, the asymmetric stretch, and the bending vibration. Let's think about what each of these vibrations looks like for water. As you might recall from video 13, in the symmetric stretch, the bonds involved in the vibration all lengthen and shorten at the same time, like this. Let's freeze the molecule at one extreme end of this vibration. When the molecule is in this configuration, it's been distorted as far from its equilibrium shape as the vibration can make it. As you know, the vibration will appear in an IR spectrum if the vibration causes the electric dipole moment to change its magnitude or direction. The character table will help us decide whether or not this is the case. Here's how. Let's take this distorted version of the molecule and imagine how the positions of all the atoms will change when we perform these symmetry operations on it. First is E. In this symmetry operation, we do nothing to the molecule. As you can understand, we don't need to do anything to the coordinates of the atoms in order to get the molecule to look the same as it did before we performed this operation. In other words, we'll multiply all the coordinates by 1. Next, let's imagine what happens when we perform the C2 operation on the molecule. When we do that, the molecule ends up looking like this. Here again, the molecule looks the same before and after performing this operation, so we just multiply all the coordinates by 1 in order to make the molecule look the same before and after the C2 operation. The same is true when we reflect the molecule in the xz plane, and also when we reflect it in the yz plane. All four of these symmetry operations 
cause no overall change in the appearance of the molecule. So all four of them only require that we multiply the coordinates of the atoms by one. So far, this all seems pretty simple. But now let's try it with the second type of vibration, the asymmetric stretch. Once again, we'll stop the molecule when it's at one extreme end of the vibration, where one of the bonds has lengthened and the other one has gotten much shorter. Now we'll perform each of the symmetry operations on that molecule. When we use the identity operator, the molecule doesn't change. So once again, we only need to multiply the coordinates of the atoms by one. Now we'll perform the C2 operation on the molecule. This time, we find out that the molecule does look different. The long and short bonds have switched positions. Think about what we'll need to do to the Cartesian coordinates of those atoms in order to get the molecule to look the same as it did before we rotated it. We'll have to multiply the x-coordinate of each atom by negative 1 in order to switch their places. However, we can keep the y and z-coordinates the same as they are. Next, let's look at the reflection in the xz plane. This leaves the molecule looking the same as it did before the reflection. And finally, let's look at the reflection in the yz plane. This causes the long and short bonds of the molecule to switch places, just as was the case for the C2 rotation we performed earlier. That means we'll have to multiply the x-coordinate by negative 1 in this case. So, why did we do all that? Well, take a look at the numbers in the middle of the character table. You'll notice that the top row has a 1 in all four of the columns beneath the names of the symmetry operations. Those numbers describe the change we need to make to the coordinates of the atoms for a particular vibration. In other words, the symmetric stretching vibration is described by this row of the character table. If you look at the left side of the table, you'll see that this row is labeled A1. That label is called the character of this vibration. We would usually express this by saying that the symmetric stretching vibration has A1 character. We could also phrase it by saying that the symmetric stretch of water transforms according to A1. Now let's look at the asymmetric stretching vibration. If you look at the character table, you can see that this row has a 1 in the columns for E and sigma xz, and a negative 1 for C2 and sigma yz. That tells us that the asymmetric stretching vibration of water transforms according to B1. What about the bending vibration? Well, if we once again stop the vibration at one extreme end of the vibration, we get a molecule that looks like this. If we think about what this molecule will look like after we perform each of the symmetry operations on it, we find out that the molecule looks exactly the same after each of the operations. So in each case, we can just multiply the coordinates by one. That means the bending vibration transforms according to A1 just like the symmetric stretch. So now we know the character of each of the vibrations that water can undergo. What can we do with that information? That's where the last part of the character table plays a role. It turns out that if a vibration causes a change in the electric dipole moment, there will be a letter X, Y, or Z in this column of the table. So, for example, the symmetric stretch and bending vibrations are in this row, and that row has a letter Z in that column of the table. That means those vibrations do appear in the infrared spectrum. The same is true for the asymmetric stretching vibration. For that vibration, there's a letter X in that column of the character table. That tells us that all three vibrations are expected to appear in the IR spectrum. And that's exactly what we see. But there's even more information about the vibrations in the character table. Notice that the symmetric stretch and bending vibrations had a letter Z in this column of the table. 
That's telling us that the electric dipole moment changes its magnitude along the z-axis during those vibrations. That makes sense. For example, if you watch the symmetric stretching vibration, you can see that the dipole moment will get larger and smaller along the z-axis as the bonds lengthen and shorten. Meanwhile, the asymmetric stretching vibration has an x in that column of the table. If you watch that vibration, you can see that the dipole moment will change in the x direction as the bonds lengthen and shorten. However, the dipole moment in the z direction doesn't change, because as one bond lengthens in that z direction, the other one shortens, so the polarity in the z direction doesn't change overall. Finally, notice that there's also a row that has a y in that column of the table. However, none of the vibrations that water can undergo result in a change in the electric dipole moment along the y-axis. So, none of the vibrations turn out to have B2 character. Let's try another example. Here's the ion platinum tetrachloride. This is a square planar ion. Based on that, let's figure out what characters a vibration can have that will allow them to appear in an infrared spectrum. The first thing we need to do is determine what point group the ion belongs to so that we can decide which character table to use. To find the point group, it's helpful to use the flow chart we saw in the last video. This ion doesn't belong to one of the easily recognized point groups, so we'll go to the right on the flow chart. As you can probably see, the major axis is the C4 axis that goes through the center of the ion. The next question we have to consider is whether or not there are any C2 axes perpendicular to the major axis. In this case, there are. For example, here's a C2 axis we can rotate the molecule around, and it's perpendicular to the C4 axis. That means we go to the left on the flowchart. The next question is whether there's a horizontal mirror plane. As you might remember from the last video, a horizontal plane is one that's perpendicular to the major axis. So, in other words, in this case, it's the plane that contains the flat ion. That plane is a mirror plane of this ion, so we do have a sigma h plane. The flowchart tells us that means the ion belongs to the point group D4H. Here's the character table for that point group. As you can see from the table, this column has an x, y, or z in these two rows. That means that vibrations that have a character A2U or EU will appear in the IR spectrum of the ion, but any other vibrations won't be in the spectrum. Let's try one more. Here's another ion, cobalt-3 hexachloride. What characters can a vibration in this ion have in order to appear in an IR spectrum? This ion belongs to one of the easily recognized point groups, the octahedral group, OH. Here's the character table for that group. As you can see, only vibrations with a character of T1U can appear in an IR spectrum of this ion. Another thing to notice is that the character table gives us a list of all the symmetry elements present in the molecule. As you can see, this octahedral ion has, for example, eight different C3 rotation axes, and six different dihedral mirror planes. If you feel like you need practice finding symmetry elements in different molecules, it'd be a great exercise to try to find those eight rotation axes and six dihedral planes in this molecule. A molecular model kit can be really helpful for a problem like that. If you get stuck, I'd be happy to help you find all those symmetry elements, but it really is a great exercise to try on your own first. Before we finish talking about vibrational spectra, let's take a quick look at the molecule carbon dioxide. Two of the vibrations of carbon dioxide are the symmetric stretch and the asymmetric stretch, which look like this. Let's think about what character those vibrations have. As we saw in the previous video, CO2 belongs to the point group 
d infinity h, which has this character table. This character table has an infinite number of columns. That's because it has an infinite number of vertical symmetry planes containing the major axis. The symmetric stretch looks like this at the extreme end of the vibration. This vibration looks exactly the same after we perform the identity operation, so we'd multiply all the coordinates by 1 to get it to look the same as it did before the operation. Similarly, it looks exactly the same after we rotate it around the major axis, and when we re reflect it in a vertical plane, or perform an inversion, or rotate it around an improper axis or rotate it around a C2 axis perpendicular to the major axis. Therefore, the correct row in the character table will have a 1 in each column for this vibration. That means this vibration transforms according to sigma g plus. Now let's think about the asymmetric vibration. At the extreme end of the vibration, the molecule looks like this. When we perform the symmetry operations, once again, the molecule looks exactly the same after we perform the identity operation. The same is true after we rotate around the major axis, or reflect in one of the vertical planes containing the axis. However, look what happens when we perform an inversion the long and short CO bonds switch places. That means we'll have to multiply the z-coordinate of each of those atoms by negative 1, since the z-axis is the one that represents the major axis of the molecule. The same is true when we rotate the molecule around an improper axis, or when we rotate around a C2 axis perpendicular to the major axis. That means that the asymmetric stretching vibration transforms according to sigma u plus. But now, look at this column of the character table. It shows us that the symmetric stretching vibration, which has character sigma g plus, doesn't have an x, y, or z in that column. So that vibration doesn't appear in an IR spectrum. However, the asymmetric stretching vibration does appear in the spectrum. That makes sense. The symmetric stretch doesn't change the polarity of the CO2 molecule because the molecule starts out nonpolar and the stretching of the carbon-oxygen bonds doesn't change that. However, the asymmetric stretch does change the polarity of the molecule. And notice that the polarity only changes along the z-axis. And that's exactly what this column of the character table is telling us. Just as we've been looking at how vibrations change the symmetry of a molecule, we could also look at how rotational motion of a molecule changes its symmetry. Just as with vibrations, in order for a rotation to produce a peak in a spectrum, the electric dipole moment of the molecule must change its magnitude or direction during the rotation. The character table can help us identify those rotations, just as it helped us identify vibrations that produce peaks in IR spectra. In order for a rotation to cause a peak in a microwave spectrum, it must have a character that has the symbol Rx, Ry, or Rz in this column of the character table. So, for example, Rotations of a molecule belonging to the C2V point group must transform according to A2, B1, or B2 in order to appear in a spectrum. There's one more type of spectroscopy that character tables can tell us about. In ordinary infrared spectroscopy, we shine light from an IR light source onto our sample and then detect the wavelengths that get transmitted through the sample. You might think that all the wavelengths that weren't transmitted must have been absorbed by the sample. But that's not necessarily true. Some of the wavelengths of light that didn't get absorbed by the sample might not have gone straight through to our detector. Instead, some of that light might have been deflected or scattered by the sample. 
If we place our detector at a right angle relative to the light that entered from the light source, we can detect that scattered light. This kind of spectroscopy is called Raman spectroscopy, after its inventor, the Indian physicist Chandrasekhara Raman. Raman was interested in many different areas of science. He studied the acoustic properties of different stringed and percussion musical instruments. He also studied the cause of the blue color of the ocean and many other phenomena. But it's his work on light scattering that's what received the most attention. As a result, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1930, which made him the very first Asian person to receive a Nobel Prize in Science. In order for a vibration to produce a signal in a Raman spectrum, the character table must have an entry in this last column of a character table. So, for example, the vibrations in a water molecule would all produce peaks in a Raman spectrum because the vibrations of water have either A1 or B1 character, and both of those rows have an entry in the last column of the character table. Now take a look at the character table for carbon dioxide again. Notice that the symmetric stretching vibration of CO2 does appear in a Raman spectrum, even though it causes no peak in an IR spectrum. For this reason, it's often useful to perform both IR and Raman spectroscopy on a molecule we're interested in identifying, because often vibrations that don't appear in one type of spectrum might appear in the other type. Well, that's enough new material for today. You'll be having another exam soon, and I hope you feel ready for that. When we meet again, we'll start taking a detailed look at the quantum mechanics of real atoms and molecules instead of just model systems like the particle in a box or the harmonic oscillator. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week and good luck on your test. <laughs>